Oh, no, 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 cut, cut, cut. I, I, I am, I... Okay, it's good to know that the pants still fit. Still fit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I was going to blame lockdown because uh, I was did a live and underground show the other the other day, and uh, Ray, Raymond was watching the show. He was like, "Why are you not wearing your live and underground t shirt?" Because my live and underground t shirt doesn't fit. I'd like to blame lockdown, but. I was a bit of a fat bastard before that. Not that I'm that f fat, it's just that I was really skinny before. Do you know what I mean? But, yeah, sure. I've, um, I've I've put on a bit of weight. I think it's even come back from China. See, the thing in China, what used to happen about once every six months, I'd be violently ill for the whole weekend. So that was always good for making sure I didn't get too fat. Yeah. But, um, but that hasn't happened back in Scotland so far. Since I've been back. Well, do you know what? We're actually going to talk more about China, but we're going to bring on our next Royal Rumbler. But you're, I want you to stay because you're you're going to do battle in a weird way because it's about can you stay till the end of the show as the number one contestant? Because I know that there's people planning and joining the chat, but they'll leave. They'll say their bit and then they'll, they'll say happy birthday. They'll humour me and then they'll leave. But after doing five and a half hours before, I think Hugh Reid might be the winner. Nobody's like, done I'm that. happy, you know, I'm stuck in my flat here in Butte, you know, so I'm happy. Well, no uh, wonder, man, it's, Butte is beautiful. Well, it's just, it has been. So, you can watch it on the big screen, yeah, we're talking about, you can watch it on the big screen if you're on Twitch, if you've got Amazon or something, and if you've got YouTube, you can watch it on the big screen. It does sound better, YouTube does sound a lot better. There's no catch, bro. I hope there isn't a catch and I'm not getting bammed up. Thanks to everyone who supported the GoFundMe. Ray Wood said, I'm often plastered and a boring old bastard. Uh, Mark Calvert, happy birthday, blue eyes, miss you. Miss you to Mark. 100 today, <laughs> awesome. You don't look a day over 55, thank you, Ray. I have a good moisturiser. Uh, brilliant, thank you, Hugh. Brilliant, Hugh, says Mary. Two Marys saying brilliant. The iconic Mad Max. That's true. It was Mad Max did the cover. He's a brilliant artist. Brilliant artist, uh, uh, Max. He was the guy who drew the cartoon. If you search Max Cartoon or something on YouTube, you'll find him. But excellent artist. Are you getting any more of those vinyls left? Believe it or not, my problem is I've got the covers, but I don't have the vinyls. <laughs> that, is a bit, that is what's so annoying. I've got about... 30 covers, but yeah. but no, but but no, the vinyls are all gone, you know. And we've got Love Butte, Raymond Dito, went over a few times and I worked and lived in, oh, can you say that word? Tinnabruik. Tinnabruik. I would imagine that's beautiful as well. Chase says, yeah. happy 40th, you cheeky bastard. It's not that bad. It's no far off, mind you. But uh, uh, cheers, Chase. For being a widow, as always. Right, it's time to bring on the second contestant and the 100th birthday dystopian online birthday party jam fest podcast Royal Rumble. Who could it be, Hugh? Who could it be? I, I, I genuinely have no idea. Genuinely I have no have idea. No I have idea. no idea either. Let's just let's just bring them on. It's Darren Connell. How you doing, oh. mate? Dun, 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 dun. I thought I would have Hulk Hogan music here for me, Mark. <laughs> the I'll worst what, fucking we're get... entrance to a yeah. Royal Rumble ever in my life. I've just realised that we had that fucking celebration song. Sorry, but the video we played at the beginning is definitely going to get me into trouble in the copyright. So... Uh, but anyway, Dan, thanks for thanks for calling. You call that radio. How you how you been? Not a problem, mate. I just want to say congratulations on number one hundred and happy birthday. Thank you, mate. Thank you. We got there was a few people asked yesterday in the group who would you like to see 
of all the guests coming back, and your name came up a couple of times. I think there was yeah. even a, a, qu a question from you. Petra, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Petra commented wanting to know if you're still wandering around the, the golf course with a weighted vest on. Uh, did we speak about that when I was yeah, on? Yeah, I think we, I think we did, man. Basically, if anyone doesn't know, Darren's been on the show twice this year already. We did the, the normal audio podcast in the olden days, back when you could actually do things like that. And then you came on the show probably about a week or two into lockdown, and you mentioned uh, that you were walking around my weighted vest in a golf course. Yes, two seconds to fix this camera, mate. Sorry. Um... Wait a minute, do I look all right here? Huh? Oh. You look great. You look, you look, mate, you're genuinely looking really well. It looks like you're actually being healthy in lockdown. Because I think it can go one or two ways, can it? You either, you know, especially for people that are being furloughed for the first time in their lives, they're actually getting quality time to themselves. So they're going to use that time to work out, learn to bake banana bread, which I've never realised how popular banana bread was, or that was a goal or a dream that people had. If I ever have enough time off, I'm going to learn banana bread. So people are either going the banana bread route or the, the solitary cocaine addiction route. Uh, so how, what was it for you? I remember one time I, t I tried fried bread for the first time when I was 19 and I ended up putting on three stone in a year. So I didn't know what to go down that route again uh, during lockdown, mate. I walked every day on the golf course with my weighted vest on until the golf course opened back up. And the guy that worked in the golf course was like, mate, you can't fucking walk through here with a weighted vest on. So I just walked about <laughs> Springburn and Bishop Briggs and all that way on there. But I'm doing well, mate. I'm happy. I lost my job and all my work and all that, but it's probably the fucking best thing that's ever happened to me, to be honest. I think we, we, we just... I think we, we spend too much time and too much importance on the work. Even when you work in an office and stuff, everybody realises that they can work, work from home now. You don't need to work in an office. I mean, are you going to go to your work sitting in your pants now in your spare room <laughs> instead of going into the tune where I sit on? Everybody's going to just say, fuck it, mate. Do you know what I mean? Wait, do you? Uh, well, 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 that's a competition. We're asking the audience okay. to, guess, to guess my age. You've got to guess my age. So, Dan, what would you guess my age is? Um, I'm 33, so I would say I'm trying a pure educated guess here. I'd say 35. Maybe it's 35. What are the comments saying? Petra says 36. Kareen says 34. But she's saying 34 a question mark, which means she's actually saying 35, isn't she? <laughs> 34 if you're lucky. That's what that question mark says. See, you 43. See if you've done that, I'm 17 or I'm it, 49. I would believe both answers. <laughs> 371 says Sharon. Uh, Celtic also says, I grew up on Butte. He's talking about uh, Hugh Reed, who we're actually going to bring back on a little second. But I just wanted to draw attention to the fact that you were saying, you're talking about going to America. Is this a real thing now? you thinking about going to America? Oh, you read my tweet. Ooh. Um, well, yeah, that kind of demeans my research. But I read a tweet. I read a tweet that you said that you're going to, you're thinking we're going to America. Is that is that for real? Uh, it's for real. I mean, obviously, it's just a pipe dream because of the coronavirus. But it's certainly, um, I'm being serious, mate. Can uh, Canada, America. I'd love to do uh, some comedy in Australia as well. I feel like I've done everything I can do in Scotland, realistically. And, uh, you know, what else am I going to do? Uh, I'd love to go to America and try it. I think you can get a 12-week visa. So go out there, they stand up and talk about Ekkies. Okay. Well, I, I, think, I think the Americans would love it. The Scottish accent's funny, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So they say... Let's bring Hugh Reid back on. Have you have you met before? Hugh Reid, Darren? Um, no, 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 not met directly. N nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Right, right. Well, this is, um, it's interesting to introduce you guys together because 
You are both comedy geniuses and legends. Well, I, d- well, I believe it or not, I don't call what I do comedy. I think other people call it comedy. <laughs> <but> med- <laughs> that, that's me being serious. No, I'm meant to be kind of tongue in cheek, you know. But no, I, um. What do you think? What do you, I, I, a, think I think you should go to America. I think you should so because it's a twelve-week people- visa. I mean, especially right now with it, with all the riots and stuff, people are right in the mood for some some ecky Scottish ecky comedy. A lot of guys do obviously really well. I'm trying to remember yeah. the name of that guy. Remember the that guy that got the that guy. show? Yeah, got the guy. Show. What's his name again? Um, he used Hitch to be Bing Hitler. He was called yeah. Bing Hitler. Cake. Uh, Craig Ferguson. Craig Ferguson. Craig Ferguson. Look, he, I mean, I, I remember I actually filmed him one time. And um, did they know about this? And, did, did you have consent? I, I did, yeah. He was introducing a band, Edith and the Ladies, actually, Max's band, who did this. And um, then I couldn't believe it because I just remember him as a guy from round about the West End and stuff, you know. And then next thing, he's got his own chat show on American television. You know, good for him. Good for him. He had to get up and go to do it. You know what I mean? And it's, so it's, it's a, I, it was a huge chat show. I mean, it's, I don't think people in Scotland realise how big Craig Ferguson is. The first time I realised, if I'm being honest, was seeing his last ever show and how he got a band for Cumbernauld and he got everyone to sing the lyrics. People like Samuel L. Jackson. You know That's I mean? true. I saw that. Yeah, that was a, that was a great clip. I just got to really. I was, as you know, in China, and then sometimes you're a bit bored, so I was searching YouTube, and then I found the show, and then I just kept one one after the other because I just remember him from a guy that was kicking about the West End, you know, uh, years ago. But as I say, you know, good luck to him. He he's the guy that did it. Other people thought about it, but he did it. So you've got what, to give what it is to him. It, what is it? We all know that the. Americans find the Scottish accent funny. That's and, true. But how many how many Scottish comedians can we think of any other Scottish comedian, comedians that tried to go to break America or not even break America? Because the thing about America is it's got a, a different size of scene, so you could actually live a quite a comfortable living by being a kind of medium level. Well, but look, obviously Billy Connolly did okay in America. Who? I mean, I, I went never to heard, China. Never heard him, pal. Never heard him. Yeah, never I, I went to China and I ended up in a in a Jackie Chan movie. I ended yeah. up on the telly and everything in China. Not that I'm massively successful, but I can tell you, I I feel I did okay in China. I'm really glad I went, and nobody would think going to China would be a career move. But as I say, I I mean, Jackie Chan, he's got to be the biggest um, Star in China, and it ended up in one in of the his world. movies. What is the biggest in the world? We got to got to give up for, for Jackie Chan. You know, and so, I think it's when you put yourself into a different culture. You know, it's like if there's a Chinese guy doing comedy here, we think that's brilliant. There's a Chinese guy doing comedy. You know, so you're immediately interested, and and so so you so you can have that effect. And of course, so many Americans trace their ancestry back to Scotland. The boy, the boy, Darren, the boy. Oh, I've got a great grandfather. Uh, he was a Connell. He was in uh, the the Eckies, but they, well, they would say Molly because that's what they call it in it. That's Molly over there. <laughs> so, pipe dream or no? If you're just going to date, I am going to date, mate. As soon as uh, I get the green light to be able to go over, I'm going to do it. There's a lot of places I want to visit, though, like the comedy store and all those types of places, and just to. Uh, to do something different. I think uh, this lockdown happening has just made me realise that life is short, mate. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Absolutely, man. I and think it... I'm more handsome than Craig Ferguson as well. <laughs> 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 well, we've got some messages. Marty Party said, oh, wait, Marty Party, by the way, I've just realised that Marty Party's know the Marty Party. I thought Marty Party was my cousin, so when I asked, if you, when I said, I hope your dad's doing all right, um, there's nothing wrong with your dad, Martin Windybank. I'm assuming that's Martin Windybank and he's by his 40. There's nothing, as far as I'm aware, there's nothing wrong with your dad. I mean, I'd fucking well, check on him. I don't know, but I thought it was a different one. Um, I hope you're well, Martin. Uh, Billy Connolly was the killer in an episode of Columbo. It's hard to top that. Would you make, would you make a Columbo? Dan Connell, Columbo. I think, um, I just found out recently 
He only had a glass. Of, he had a glass eye, didn't he? Yeah, but you didn't notice that. I mean, I knew his eye was fucked, but I never knew it was a glass eye. I think that's pretty cool. Um, I've had bad eyesight my whole life, and um, that inspires me. <laughs> I don't know much about him. What's his name? Peter Falk. Peter Falk. Oh, he did, he, I mean, I just know him as Columbo. I think he did appear maybe in a couple of things I watched, and I was like, that's there's Columbo. Q, you maybe give us a bit more of history and Peter Falk. What he, was he just Columbo? Did he do other things? I'm sure he must have done other things, but again, like yourself, <laughs> I just remember him as Columbo. Yeah. James and it was good. Columbo. <laughs> Sean Drysdale never knew that Columbo had a glass eye. You're not alone. Educational this tonight. Hugh, Darren, and Mark threw an Elvis Juice Hayes comedy titillation time. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, yeah, that... I'm also I'm also remembering the Glasgow band. You know the Alabama Three. They did the music for the Sopranos. Yes, absolutely. Well, we 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 had uh, R.I.P. Jake Black. We had Jake on one of the on a, an episode that you call that radio the audio podcast, and we did a wee tribute to him during lockdown as well to celebrate. Well, commiserate um, a year of him passing away. Alabama 3 changed the game, and I think it's quite inspiring for me because I, I, I knew Alabama 3 before The Sopranos. It just as a wee guy, I heard them on Lamac Live or something, and I had no idea there was there was any kind of Scottish connection. I just totally fell for it. And then just, and I think Sopranos for me is probably one of the most important TV shows. Certainly the, the last one that I watched every week till it actually finished. Now it's all about box sets, but there's something different about growing up with the characters and watching it every week and then having to wait six months to a year before it comes back. Would you agree with that, Dan Connell? Um, yeah, I only recently watched The Sopranos about last year. and I binged it in my mate's house when I was cat sitting. Uh, it took me about 14 days and it was just unbelievable. And I'm the same way Alabama 3. I never realised there was a Scottish connection. Um, I've seen them live a couple of times. And uh, I, I love The Sopranos and I love Alabama 3. They're cool as well. It's, it's, um, Jake's an absolute legend in the Scottish music industry. And it's also, he's quite humble with the fact and quite honest about it. He was quite honest about the fact that that was a life changing thing as well. Yeah. So, you know, like to get a wee bit of luck and obviously, I don't agree with bands. I mean, I don't judge bands and selling out, but I, I kind of like you didn't need to do that fucking McDonald's advert and stuff. But there's not, it's not selling out. It's the coolest thing ever to make a song and then one of the best TV shows ever uses your song at the start of it. That's making it. We've got a new Royal Rumbler joining the show, contestant number three. Let's uh, bring him on. Jim Monaghan. How you going? How's it going? Happy birthday. Thank oh, happy birthday to you. It was your birthday yesterday. Yeah. Sorry for taking the shine off of your birthday because Facebook said my birthday was yesterday. I should have been well, a day most people, I think I think most people were more excited about mine, to be honest. And you <laughs> you'd get a little bit of the second wave spin off for that happening. So. Well, I was more it. excited about Jim's and I don't even know him. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I've got I've got balloons for you. Excellent. Two of the balloons are for me, two of the balloons are for you. How how does we Hugh Reed? Good, Darren. How you doing? I'm surprised I'm that Hugh Reed and Jim Warren don't know each other. Does, Jim, do you know Dan? I know Darren well, yes. Sir. So, yeah. see, my, my problem is I've been 10 years in China. Genuinely, that, that's my problem, you know. So, I, I and then I came back Well, Jim is lockdown. quite young. Jim is, Jim is just leaving school around about that time. <laughs> so, I, was, um, I, I, I do, I have seen you live many times, actually. But probably way, way back. Probably uh, 90s. Back but, when I was young. You know? Well, I... I'm glad you saw me. I'm glad you saw me live, and you didn't see me dead. You know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so how's Mark, how's the I seen, um, I seen you Sorry, talk Dan? about scheme. 
about the lead singer passing away. Have yeah. You, have you mentioned that in the show? Yeah, we did. What we did was a wee, a wee stream on the day that I found the news. We were just... It's, there's a wee bit of an echo coming. Jim, do you have any headphones? I think that's came from coming from you just now. No, don't have me. No, no, it's all right. Sorry. Just, I'll, just, I'll just mute. I'll just mute while I'm asking the question. So, um, yeah, there was a Denny for the scheme passed away sadly last week, and we did a we. I just, I just shared. I just streamed the the documentary Innocent as Hell and a few of his tunes that day. But we are going to do an abs a proper tribute to Denny. Uh, one of my friends, Kirsty, knows the, the band and the family well, and we're going to get everyone on to, uh, to, to tell some stories, man. And if you don't know who Scheme are, then it's a, a really important band for the, the working class political band uh, from Easterhouse in the 80s. And, uh, yeah, Denny was an absolute legend. And, I, I, you know, I've got... I, mean, I bumped into him a few times, just randomly weird places like... And Aaron on January the 1st, he just appeared at an open mic night and he said, oh, I went, he did a song and I went, oh, I've missed the curfew. And I was like, have you fucked Mr. Curfew? And I tell the guy, this is Denny for scheme, get him on. And he played a few tunes, we got a wee jam with him. Just a lovely guy, man. He, he just didn't, you know, he didn't have ears and graces or anything like that. And um, so I didn't know him well, but uh, yeah, we're going to do a, a tribute for him because I think scheme is really important. I'm damned, did you, we, we, was it? Part of growing up was scheme a thing for you. Well, um, I was born in '87, so I kind of missed it in my childhood. But I've got three big older brothers that were mad for them, and uh, I used to listen to them when I was younger. But um, I, all I knew was that they, they, they were the first unsigned band to sell out the pavilion a couple of times. Um, they've got a couple of absolute belters of tunes, and I was sad. It's sad that he passed away. But what a yeah. legacy. Good on him. Hugh? Yeah, I saw Scheme lots of times. There was a time, you know, in the 80s, it seemed as if every bar you went into, you know, Scheme was scheme were on. But I, again, I think they were a good band. It's kind of like, a bit with yourself or Colonel Mustard, you know, it's kind of, it was a local thing, but they were really popular. But it wasn't as if they were getting like national media or even STV or anything was picking up on it. And they should have been picking up on it because they had a genuine roots support. And I remember that them selling out the pavilion, you know, a couple of times. But I saw them, I don't know how many times I saw them, at least four or five times minimum. And and the Apollo as well, wasn't it? It was just... Is that and, right? Yeah. And yeah, the, yeah. I'll, I'll actually get the real, the real stats... 3,000 people. Jim, I'll unmute you, sorry, man. Uh, Scheme, what were they, what were they Scheme, on? Yeah, I, mean, I, was, I'm, I was 57 yesterday, so Scheme are just right in my era. So I was like kind of young punk. But in the coming into Glasgow, they were very much a Glasgow thing, I think, though. But we were well aware of them. I saw them a few times in pubs and things. I wasn't any of the big gigs, the Pavilion or the Apollo. I think that they're the only band to have played the Pavilion, the Apollo and the Barrowlands, I think. I, I think they've those three venues or something. But what they did, I was and going Kelvin to, Hall and Kelvin Hall, I believe. Is, is that what it was? That might have been those three. I but um, uh, I was going to see what you said. Very much like like Colonel Mustard or something. You know, they built up such an incredible following just from gigging and from that grassroots thing. It's quite unique, you know. And also, do you think the reason that they didn't get any of the STV press was just uh, well, it was a, a political decision because it was too political. It was stature. That's where the music was coming from. I, was, I'll be honest with you. I think it was snobbery. Because everyone knows they were from Easter House and they were very proud of their roots. And I've nothing I, I, I've dealt with some STV and BBC people, especially at that time. And it was it was a total middle class thing, absolutely. So that it's kind of like they wouldn't have been happy about that. That that would have been a kind of form of censorship, as far as I'm concerned. I, I totally agree with that. It, it was a political thing because if you remember at that time, there was a lot of political music. All over the place in the charts, UB40 and the specials and all that kind of stuff. So it wasn't that um, they were scared of touching political stuff. It was, um, I think, like like as Hugh says, I think it was a class thing. I think at the time the BBC, it was probably still a bit like this, but no offence to Andy for the BBC, but at the time BBC and the kind of STV, Radio Clyde and all that had a certain kind of group of people who would only cover a certain kind of thing and scheme. 
one of the one of those kind of guys, one of the pop star guys, one of the, the kind of guys you could you would sit in the couch at the breakfast television or anything. So, Jim, have you got a poem for us? I heard a rumor you've I'm got funny. a poem. I was going to do the obvious one with the backstory. Well, well, that's fine. We'll do it. Yeah. Let's do that. I'll give you a wee. I'll yeah. give you a wee intro. I'll give you a wee intro for the. What's that? I don't because I want to see if this actually is working again because it was broke for a few days. <laughs> yeah, go for it, man. Okay, I, I I wrote this poem um for a, a gig that Mark had organised, and it, I know it's nine years ago because it's it's about my birthday, so it has that. So I know I wrote it nine years ago. Can I ask, <laughs> can I just pick up on something though? You said in a in a lovely post, and I'm not. It was a great post, and you're saying nice things about me. Uh, yeah. Yesterday or today, I think it was today. It's hard because Facebook said my birthday was yesterday, so it's confused everyone, including myself, of what when my birthday began and when it ends. But you said that I gave you a business card, and I find that really hard to believe that nine years ago, me nine years ago, I got a business card at Wickerman Festival. What was it like it a did. fucking post it note, a post it note or something? Like, um, I think it had fucking people, people on it or something. Oh no, the- you're right, you're right. You're right. People, people yeah. gave me a business card to make me look more professional. I take that yeah. back. You're right. You were, okay. you were giving them to everybody to get fucking rid of them. You were like, like a kid with like a whole load of new business cards. Well, I, well, I, I come from a flyering background. So, I'd, I mean, obviously, that's another thing that you can't get away with in COVID. You know, I can't be handing out flyers for you call that radio or business cards. Everyone's freaking out. <laughs> I think, sorry, I interrupted your story, Jim. Wait, wait. That, that, um, I'll tell that story as well then. So, I, yeah, I met Mark, uh, first time I met Mark was nine years ago, and I can trace that through this poem, uh, at Wickerman Festival, and I'd been performing in the Ingrid Pitt stage, it was called. I think Darren Connell was on that night as well, and it might have been a Wickerman, but I think the first time I saw Darren was at the Wickerman at midnight or something. Top, uh, it, was actually, it was actually why he put Tesco's bags onto Wayne's Heads. So was it, 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 <laughs> were, you still, were you still on it? Obviously, Darren, your teetotal these days, but we Wicker Man nine years ago, what, what state were you in then? Oh, that was um, that was a write off. I think my dad's watching this, so no comment. <laughs> <laughs> moving on, moving on, Jim, tell the story. So, I met Mark and uh, he invited me to a gig, which is, I think was about like the week later or four or five days later, and it was one of the kind of regular things you do around about what, what's the one you do around about your birthday? Or is it to celebrate a, 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 a friend's life or something? You always do a gig around about that time. Uh, oh, yeah, no, I know, no, right, I know what you mean, yeah. That, that's, um, you're talking about uh, R.I.P. Fergie. We did, we did a gig around about then uh, to celebrate his life. We don't always do a gig, but we always meet up and celebrate his life once a year, yeah. And so and so for that, because it was Matt's birthday and it had just been my birthday, I wrote a poem uh, about uh, called what I got for my birthday. It's in my book, and it's um. And your book is available to purchase, I believe. Yes, you can purchase it. There's still a few left on speculative book dot speculative books dot net. I'll put you a can, link in the comments to that. I think there's only a, like like ten copies left, so hurry up. But there might be another one. Anyway, uh, I, so this poem became one of my absolute stalwarts. One of the my, one of my best poems. When I do live on games, it's one of my most popular ones and one of my favourite ones to to uh, to read. Uh, and, it, and it comes about from meeting Mark and Mark's birthday thing. But I, I did write it for Mark's gig, but I am a poet, so I wrote it about me, not not him, which which is uh, what poets would do. Anyway, do you want me? Do you want the poem? Yeah. Go for okay. it. We'd love the poem. This is called uh, "What I Got for My Birthdays." Age six. Main Street Crooked Home, me and my mum on the bus to Kilmarnock. And we went to the kiosk cafe for cheeseburgers and milk. And I got a Joe 90 doll. And he was made of spongy, foamy rubber. I chewed and chewed and chewed all the way through to his 1960s skeleton, metal spikes. Age 12, Chapel Lane Golson. My dad said I was to get nothing because we'd went the week before to the children's panel, but I got sladest by slade, and it was made of anthems, or stomping and chanting and strumming, and that kept me going until punk. Age 18, Gateside Road, Golson. I just got back for holiday that morning, when we went, me and Gal, 
to a party in your mills. And I got Susan Turner and a kicking for her boyfriend. And she was made of smiles and eyes, all shiny and clever and beautiful. And I was in love for a while. Age 25, Dungavel Road, Kilmarnock. Me and Mary were no longer married. We went to Millport, bed and breakfast, chips and bingo, and we got a baby on the way. And he was made of caring, sharing, tolerance and respect. And that present, I got to keep forever. Age 40, Lamlash Bay, Aaron. They came from far and wide, mainly Stuart and Falkirk, but quite far. And we went to the beach with champagne and cake. And I got all my friends together at one place at one time. And that was made of Paul and Geraldine, Liam and Billy, Melanie and Molly. The kind of present you don't use all the time. You put it away, but it's there when you need it. Age 48, George McTurk Court, Cumnock. Woke up creaking. Not one single fucking present or card. So I went to my mum's for cheeseburgers and milk and I got over 120 happy birthday messages on Facebook. And later that night, oh, and it was made of digital signal and binary code. And later that night, later that night, buoyed by my new popularity, I had an Asda meal for one. Thank you. Is Mark gone? No, I'm here. I'm here. I'm just <laughs> going to put rid of a pot. You call that radio. Fucking fucking radio. Here to tell the people that we hear you. One God will not allow. You call that radio. I hope you want to see it. You call that radio. <laughs> You call that you want to say it, that's kind of part of the fun. Powered by our patrons. Brothers and sisters. Jim, morning. Smashing it. Excellent. Very good. Really enjoyed it. Uh, we've got Angela, Angela Doherty says, fantastic poem. Round, round of applause from Ray Woods. Good stuff, Jim from Mary Veronica. Awesome from Nigel. Yes, Jim, nice one. Sorry I'm late from Soapy. <laughs> Fuck's sake, Soapy. Fuck's sake, Soapy. Brilliant, <laughs> says Marty Party, who's Marty Windybank, not actually my cousin Marty Party. Uh, round of applause from Kareen. Uh, we first met Mark on a sex tour about six years ago. And <laughs> I, I, I have no idea what you mean. I've never been on a sex tour. <laughs> <laughs> what? Oh, apparently I have been on a sex tour. Okay, I'll need to maybe explain what that is. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So there was a thing. There was a thing was where I was counting in the back. Sorry. <laughs> yes, you were, a, you were on a sex tour. Yeah. No, I was actually. I just. It was. A, it was. A, it was, a, it was a, I was commissioned. This has not happened very often, but. I was commissioned to do a poem and the, the theme was sexuality. So it was like a kind of a, a, a tour of Glasgow where it was like it was like a pop-up poetry <laughs> everywhere along the tour. And I did a poem on a on a sex tour. It is a sex tour, he's right. It's uh, you ever you ever you ever been commissioned to do a poem on a sex tour, Jim? Uh, no, not a sex tour. Um I think I, I don't know if any anybody would ever associate me. Or my poetry was sex at all. Ni neither me, man. That's why I was really adamant. I did the Glasgow Subway about. once. We did, the, we did the Glasgow Subway. It was organised by Kevin Goldie and different poets performed at different uh, stations. And Kevin performed on, on the actual train, which is a bit daft because 
some ways are so fucking loud, nobody can hear your poem. But I, I had to stand at Govan Station and DM, read poems while people just kind of hurried past me and like, covered their range ears and all that stuff. And uh, But that was interesting. Greasy says, good poem, Jim. Happy birthday, Matt. Lang me your lumbreak. Thank you, Greasy. Sad ending, though, says Ray. Do you know what? What, what, what age were you when you ended the poem? Are you no duty to add another verse, or are you just going to leave it like that forever? No, I think that's fine where it was. I wrote it I wrote it, and within a... It normally takes me a long, long time to write a poem, and that one was one of the... And I think most of my better... Most of my most popular poems are ones that did they take me long to write. It just kind of came out of me. And then, because I had that kind of list element and age element to it, it made it a bit easier to fit in. But, also, um, people are going to think you're younger every time yeah. you perform it. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that's it. People think I'm just... I don't, I don't look much older than 48, to be honest. <laughs> and you're, you're, um, are you missing Wickerman Festival, though? I, I love the Wickerman Festival. And, I mean, I, I performed that. I, I, I don't know how many. I think there was 10 Wickerman Festivals. And I probably read poems at, at probably six or seven of them and, and went to other ones. And it was being from Ayrshire, being from Cumnock. Like, that was, um, that, that was uh, although it's still about 70 miles down there, it was a long way. It was kind of in our neck of the woods. So when I went there, loads and loads of people I knew were there all the time. They would, they, uh, me and Rob Wilson would get a really big crowd in the poetry tent and all that stuff because of that. And loads of people I knew from Glasgow went as well. So it, it was a really cool wee festival. It got the right balance of not being too big, the, the family thing and all that stuff. And it was a shame to see it go. But um, I don't think that Jamie Goroy, who, who organised it, died. And the, the very last one was organised by his wife and his daughter, and I don't think their heart was in it after that. It'd only been a few months after he died, and then and then they didn't do it anymore. So I think it was just that it was specific to the guy who had the idea in the first place, you know. It's um, it, obviously that was so. Was it was it the poetry tent that you played in, Darren? Was where yeah. was that? <clears throat> Darren, was it? So is it? Did they do poets then comedians? And how, what's it like? Played. I mean, you. If you're getting the midnight shift, that must be a difficult one. As a comedian at a rock festival when everyone's pushed, and also it's a poetry tent. Yeah, it was pretty weird going up and uh, doing a set after a poet at half eleven on Saturday night after fucking. I think who was it? Tim Booth for James. So it was a good gig, though. Like Jim says, I mean, when you're at your box, you just go up and try your best and everybody knows the situation so uh, but there was Wayne's running about and stuff and uh, I don't have it <laughs> no, yeah. so I just done my set and surprised <laughs> <him there. laughs> considering the circumstances but I never knew that guy passed away Jim that was sad yeah I, I, mm -hmm. he was a good he was a good lad so, I say when you're when you're doing Wait, you see, because I would imagine with, with Scott Squad, Dan, you've obviously got a family audience now. So, people, does it ever, does it ever happen whereby your people are like coming to your gig or or expecting you to be like more kind of family friendly, just doing Bobby for Scott Squad, and then you do what you do, which is yeah. kind of I would call psychedelic, surreal, adult comedy. I um I've got uh, Bobby fans or Sesame Panto as well. It's children and people that love Bobby are kind of OAPs, you know, like your granny. And then they'll come to a stand up show and they'll listen to me talk about trying to kill myself and stick skin fools a speed up my asshole, thinking. <laughs> your dad's Bobby? still watching, I think. <laughs> I was kidding on that. Uh, <laughs> Don't get me that, I give. It's over. My shows are over 18, but uh, I think people are a wee bit surprised because Bobby is uh, uh, a man child, isn't he? I don't know. I don't even know what Bobby is. What is what is uh, the, the deal with, with Scott Scott? I think we spoke about it before, but I forget. And I know that everyone will be this watching is probably curious what's happening with Scott Scott. Was it in the middle of getting filmed, or, or what? what is going on with that? Yeah, um, they stopped production halfway through. I managed to film a couple of days, but they stopped because of the coronavirus. 
So I've heard that it might be coming back and filming uh, sometime in August. Uh, but I'm not too sure what's happening with health and safety laws and stuff. But I'll just be grateful for things to get back to normal. And I'm looking forward to it, I know, mate. Definitely. Is there, a, have you, is there any kind of filming stuff starting to get back to normal? Because in some ways, obviously, filming is just as bad as... Uh, you know, well, it's, it's not as bad as live music, but for, for certain things, we, we you know, I, I haven't been an experienced one day extra in Outlander with millions of people stoking about, then obviously that's done. But I suppose with filming, if, you, if you're smart with it, you could actually film quite a lot with, with minimal people and keeping social distance and stuff. So is there any kind of like, oh, we could maybe do that, that project could maybe work, or maybe we could just change it a bit? Well, I haven't heard much about it because I, I'm only an actor on it, but I think it, it does make it easier because it will it will just be me and Karen doing the scenes or if I'm doing a scene with someone else, it will only be uh, one or two actors. So um, there's a possibility that it will be pretty simple. Um, River City and all that's coming back and I've heard that they're all, you know, they're starting to work all this stuff into the storylines, so everything always works out, and um, I get told yesterday by the the makeup girl to not get a haircut for continuity with Bobby, so I'm happy with that, it's, it's looking good. When I get told not to get a haircut for filming, it looks like it's gone ahead. <laughs> Jim Warren, sorry I muted you, it's just sometimes when there's a chat happening, you're not, you're not there. You can just see you can just see them changing the script right now with Bobby coming in to see Officer Karen with, <laughs> with the, the wrong mask on and all that. Aye. Wash your hands, Bobby. And all Aye, that. Bobby's not got not <laughs> sanitizing his hands. He's not wearing a mask and he's just walked into a police station. It writes itself. Wearing, wearing a balaclava. Wearing a balaclava instead or something. Well, <laughs> uh, today was today's the first day that I was actually out and an and uh, I went went for a meal outside in the new normal and got a train in the new normal. It's mad, isn't it? It's pretty daft. Right? I, I found it coming from Butte because in Butte, you know, we just walk about here where there's not been much problem. But when I first went to Glasgow two weeks ago, for me, it seemed more oppressive, you know? Aye. Because here I just, I just walk out the door and get in my bicycle or go to the shop. That's about it, you know? And also, seemed, you, you, you've done it. You've done loads in lockdown. But, well, a- well, I just because I found myself on Butte. Maybe I'm the type of guy who's always trying to be the centre of attention. In some ways, I'm thinking I'm stuck on this island. What can I do to get some attention onto me? So I, I started making my Huey beautiful Butte. You know, just these sort of uh, wee videos and uploading them to YouTube. What, what, what one do you think? What's your favourite one that you've done? Um. It's it's really hard to say. I I, th- I think. Well, um, the reason I'm asking, uh, you know, I need an actual answer for you, Hugh, because I'm going to play a wee bit of it as we arrange the next Royal Rumble contestant. So I'm just going to play like, a, a few minutes, a couple of minutes of your one of your beautiful beauties. Is there well, anyone? Well, that maybe maybe you could put the first one if you wanted. You could put the first one. Well, of course, I've, I've made I've made want... six of them just in this time. That's six. I mean, you should be getting picked up by someone for that, surely. Uh, well, I, and I'll tell you, it was an ideal time to do it because the roads are really quiet. And then I just got on my bicycle. I uh, just do it. And um, and then it made me go, if, the, if places had been open, like say the castle had been open or the museum had been open, you would have gone to those obvious places. But, you know, because they are not open, then you just find other places to go. And it, it's helped me discover the island, and and I feel I've got a bit of support out of just doing that. So, well, I think um, you've done a great job, man. I've not watched them all yet because I can't believe how consistent you've been. You're just knocking them at the party. You've got you're up to episode six. But what we're going to do just now is, guys, we're going to play a little clip from Hurie's beautiful Butte, and then we're going to come back and get the next dystopian birthday party jam fest podcast contestant on so you can find these all on youtube this is a uh, part one of fury's beautiful beauty oh. 
Yeah, there we go.